God, we do love you this morning. We praise you. We give you great uh, glory and thanks. God, we are grateful for each breath that we draw, for um, safety, security, God, for freedom in this country to come and to hear from your word together. God, there are people all over the world that don't get this opportunity today. God, grateful for um, the ways that you bless us and care for us. And, and most importantly, God, we're grateful for your son, Jesus, uh, the author and perfecter of our faith, the beginning and the end, the alpha and omega, the lion and the lamb that uh, came as a sacrifice for sinners like me and stood in my place. So God, we want to give you uh, honor today, and glory today, by looking into your word and allowing it to change us as a grateful response uh, to all that you've done. In Christ's name, amen. amen. So at the end of last fall, I kind of divide Marketplace up into uh, semesters a little bit. So at the end of last fall, we reviewed all of the principles that we had learned in our study of the parable. So this morning, we're going to review all of the principles we've learned in systematic theology this year. And we're going to kind of take a 30,000 foot view of all of them, but we'll walk through them one by one. The first thing is we talked about the character of God. We talked about his greatness on display in creation. He created the moon and the stars and the sun, and he created you and me. And he holds all things in his hand. The word of God says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. One of the things that we mentioned in, in the creation story in Genesis is that there's kind of that one word tag on phrase, and it's just one word in the original language that means God created the stars. Just one word. Just one word, God created the stars. We watched that video of all the greatness and the majesty of God that's in control of all of those things. We talked about God's holiness that he's set aside, that he's consecrated, that he's different than us, that his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. So far, the heavens above the earth is his thoughts above our thoughts and his ways above our ways. And the other aspect of his holiness that we talked about is his moral purity. God is always just, he's always kind, he's always good, he's always right. He is the definition of holiness. We talked about his grace, his grace. And we talked about the, the tension that happens because God's holiness demands justice, but his grace demands undeserved favor. So how does he do that? How does he reconcile those things? Which, which one gets sacrificed? Which one gets diminished? Which one gets compromised? But because he sent his son Jesus, he could satisfy his grace and extend undeserved favor to you and me and still satisfy his holiness. Sin still gets punished. It just got punished in Jesus and not in you and me. So he satisfied his holiness and he satisfied his grace because he ex extended undeserved favor to sinners like you and me. We talked about God being independent, that he gets to define himself. Uh, that little phrase that we used throughout the, throughout the semester this spring uh, or throughout the spring this year is uh, that God is, God is independent. He gets to define himself, not you, not me, and not Ray Lewis. God is independent. He gets to define himself. Then we talked about the fact that God created man in his own image. God gave man a spirit life, an internal spiritual being, because God is spirit. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was void and without form, and the spirit of God hovered over the surface of the deep. And in Genesis 2, 7, he breathed that spirit life into man and created you and me in his own image, created man in his own image. He made us creative. He gave us uh, the ability to make moral choices. We're not just instinct driven like an animal. Um, God created us in his own image, but man chose to walk away from God. And Jamie talked about sin. I'm so glad that Jamie talked about sin because that meant I didn't have to. Um, we talked about the fact that in Genesis 3, 
Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled and ran away from God. And that sin, that corruption has trickled down to you and me and has done so generation after generation after generation. That our entire being is corrupted by sin. Other words for sin are rebellion, running away from God, saying no to God. God, (laughs) we talked about the fact that God created man and woman and put them in paradise and gave them unbelievable tasks to do, to be productive and to give him glory. He walked with them like a friend walks with them in the cool of the day. He made them both naked and he commanded them to be fruitful and multiply. Read between the lines there. And yet God, or yet man still figured out a way to mess that up. (laughs) All that that God blessed man with, all that that God gave man, and man still figured out a way to mess it up. And you and I, I have been doing that to this day. God gave you blessings. He created you in his image. He created me in his image. He gave me opportunity to give him glory, opportunity to walk with him. And time and time again, I ran away from him. One of the things we talked about is that if God would have punished sin like he should have punished sin, the Bible should have ended right about there. (laughs) Genesis chapter 3. When man ran away from God and rebelled and said no to God and spat in his face and ran and and, and went a different direction, that God had every right to kind of obliterate the world and just go on living in perfect unity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and just be done with it. But he didn't. He didn't because he's gracious and he's kind and he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So he began to restore relationship with mankind through covenant. Covenant. He made a covenant with Adam. He made a covenant with Noah. He made a covenant with Abraham. He made a covenant with Moses. He made a covenant with David. And each covenant has a covenant mediator, human covenant mediator. And there's stipulations in each covenant. And there's a covenant community attached to each. And finally, the final covenant that God makes with his people, stipulated in Jeremiah 31, is the new covenant. Where he promises he'll give us a new heart, that he'll write the law on our heart. And the new covenant was ratified by Jesus. New covenant was ratified by Jesus. Jesus shows up and we talked about the person of Christ, fully God and fully man, not 50-50, not one disguised as another, but fully God and fully man. So that like Hebrew says, Jesus could die once for all. Once for all. Uh, The Old Testament says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So a human for a. So God had to become a human in order to die for human beings. Lambs don't work. Rams don't work. Doves don't work. Eye for eye. Tooth for tooth. Human for human. So God became fully man so that he could go to the cross on our behalf. And because it was not just one man dying for one man, it was the God man, he could die for all men. And he lives now at the right hand of the father and intercedes for you and me. He's our advocate, our friend, our helper. Jesus, the son of the living God. And he functions in three ways. We talked about the offices of Christ, that he is a priest. He represents God to man, that he's a prophet. He represents God's truth to us. He kind of acts both ways. Do you see it? He represents God to, uh, man to God and represents God to man as priest and prophet. And he represents God's authority as king. Then we talked about our response to Jesus, our response to this covenant that he extends. God restores man by grace alone, through faith alone. By grace alone, through faith alone. And then finally, when Jesus left this earth, he left his spirit. He left his spirit for us believers that we may interact with him and know him. If God created us in his image, if God gave us a spirit, you are not a body that has a soul. You are a soul that has a body. You are a spirit being. The things you can touch, taste, see, smell, that's that's kind of you, but it's the tent that holds the you that's really you. And the you that's really you is your spirit. So God gave us his spirit. 
to convict the world of sin and guilt, to be our helper, to be our advocate, to walk with us so that we might have relationship with him. And the thing that, that just blows my mind about the promise of the Holy Spirit is that Jesus literally says, it's better for you that I go. This is a better deal for you that I go so that I might send my spirit to live in you and dwell within you. Finally, Jesus established the community of the new covenant. We talked about all the covenants in the Old Testament and each has a covenant community attached with it. The covenant community now is called the church. The church. We talked about the fact that the church is an organism and not an organization. That it is not a buffet. It is a potluck. And it is not optional because it, because it is the new covenant community. Finally, last week, we talked about the requirements for discipleship, that we deny ourselves, Just as Peter says, I don't even know that man. The invitation of Christ is that we say, I don't even know Luke anymore. I don't know selfishness anymore. I don't know self-interest anymore. And I choose a willful, deliberate, premeditated decision to walk away from self-interest and live for the interest of Jesus. We talked about the fact that Jesus invites us to take up our own instrument of execution, carry it to the Calvary, put it in the ground and watch our old self die and live a new life in him. Bless the Lord, Galatians 2.20, for I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live now, I live in faith. And the son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. It is a glorious and, and magnificent and often unbelievable truth of the scripture that we could trade this measly, humble, meager, no good little life. And Jesus gives us his life in return. Amen. That's, that's a that's not a good trade for Jesus. <laughs> That's, we, we won in that deal. For I'm crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. We talked about the benefits of this discipleship. According to Mark 8, that my life will be spared. It's not contingent upon earthly things. And it's concerned with the part of me that is most valuable. My soul, my spirit, the internal me. And it means that Jesus will be proud of me. He'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And that's what we covered this spring. So what's next? What's next? What is the mission of believers? And that's what we're going to try to answer today and call it a spring and be done and get together uh, after Labor Day again. But what is the mission of believers? And as I thought about this the last couple of days, here's what I think most of us think. This is what I think most of us think, that the mission of believers, the mission of Christians, the mission of the new covenant community is to live moral lives. That's what I think most of us think. And we say it differently all the time. We say things like, well, I, I obey the moral commands of scripture. I walk in obedience to Jesus. Or if we ask someone, what makes you a Christian? They would start listing the things that they do that are in accordance with the laws of scripture. And they'll list the things that they don't do that are in accordance with the laws of scripture. Now, if you press them on it and say, is that really the mission of believers? They might go, well, I don't know, maybe Matthew 28, which we'll get to in a little bit. Maybe that's the mission of believers. But but tell me if I'm wrong, because I do this all the time. If I kind of evaluate where I am with Jesus, the first thing I run to is morality. That's the first thing I run to. The second thing I run to is how much of the Bible am I reading and how often am I praying? I, we used to do this with, with high school students when I would disciple high school students and, and we, would, we would talk about uh, where their spiritual life was at. Like, how are you doing in your spiritual life? What's up with Jesus? What's Jesus doing in your life? And they would answer with, I've had this many quiet times this week. That's what they would answer. I've had this many devotions. So we judge ourselves, we measure ourselves based on morality. Please understand me, I am not encouraging you to live an immoral life. <laughs> Morality is, is in, in, in walking in accordance with the laws of the scripture is absolutely the call of Jesus. 
But there's a greater call of Christ, so great that he came back from the dead in order to communicate it to his disciples. Could you imagine that, right? Like the ghost of Christmas past or something like that. Someone comes back from the dead to communicate one thing and one thing only. Jesus crucified, dead in the grave for three days, came back from the dead, and he could have just gone to heaven, right? Go be with the Father, but he didn't. He stuck around to communicate the mission of the church, the mission of believers. And if you have your Bible, open it up, Matthew 28. Here it is. I typically read from the English Standard Version. I'm going to be reading from the New King James this morning. So if you're kind of not matching with the translation, that is fine. Here it is, Matthew 28, and we're going to start in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain, which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The chief activity of any and every Christ follower is to make disciples. That's the bottom line point that we're talking about this morning. The chief activity of any Christ follower is to make disciples. It's to be a disciple and a disciple maker. That's the one thing Jesus came back from the dead to communicate to you and me. Be a disciple and a disciple maker. It's my humble opinion that the primary thing that's wrong with the church today, the primary struggle with the church today is that we don't obey the Great Commission. That's the primary thing that that causes us to stumble as a church, that causes us to not be as productive, to not advance the kingdom, is that we don't uh, advance the Great Commission this right here, discipleship and being a disciple maker. We're good about living moral lives. We're good about voting well. We're good about talking about the moral fabric of our country. All those things, praise God, I'm a part of. I probably voted the same way most of y'all voted. About as many times as I voted. There you go. It's, a, it's like the JFK election, right? All those, Chicago. like 350,000 dead people in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> Good grief. I'm, look, look I'm, a, I'm about that stuff. Jesus is about that stuff. But the chief activity of any Christ follower is to make disciples. I heard an interview recently on the radio with two very, very prominent senior pastors here in the valley. If I name their names, you would probably know who they are. One was interviewing the other. And the one asked the other a question. He said, look, I want you to tell me the primary thing that's wrong with your church today. Not the global church, not the big C church, not the American church, your church. And then he named his church. And he said, I'm going to give you a second to think about it. I've got some other questions here so you can ponder and, and, and tell me the one, the primary problem with your church because I don't need to think about it. Seriously? You don't need to think about it? Oh no, I got, a, I got an answer right now. It's like, I didn't give you these questions in advance. You didn't have opportunity to think this through and you already know what the primary problem is with your church. Oh, absolutely. All right, well then tell me. The primary problem with our church is that we have a ton of young people that are dying for disciplers and a ton of older people that refuse to do it. That's the primary problem with our church. It's a great commission. Be a disciple maker. That's not me. That was a senior pastor, very prominent senior pastor in the valley. I, I won't name his name. It, it rhymes with Daryl Del Husay. Um, <laughs> but I won't, I won't name his name. The core problem with today's church is that we don't obey the great commission. Why not? Well, it was hard. It's just, it's just hard. I mean, living a moral life and checking ourselves off 
one, you know, I did these things and I don't do these things. That's relatively easy. I like that personally because I like to measure how I'm doing. And, and, and with morality, I can measure that. But disciple making is hard. The second reason I think that we don't obey the Great Commission is we'd rather focus on changing the world top down. That's what we're going to do. We're going to get the right leaders in place, the right folks in place, and change the world from the top down. Jesus, throughout his entire ministry, has always invited you and me to change the world from where? The bottom up. Bottom up. Who wants to be greatest? He must become servant of all. Jesus, in John chapter 13, knowing that the Father had given all things into his control, he had everything into control. The, the, the very being who spoke into existence all that we can see and all that we can't see, the greatness and the majesty of God that we talked about, embodied in Jesus Christ. So, that one word in the scripture, so, for that reason, he had everything under control and for that reason, he got up, took off his outer garment, wrapped a towel around his waist, and started to wash feet. Jesus has always been about changing the world from the bottom up. And that's what the Great Commission is about. The last thing that, the last thing that I think that kind of helped or that, that, that hinders us, the last hurdle of the Great Commission is that it's, it's messy. Disciple making is messy. It requires being around people. And I'll be straight with you. I don't like people very much. You've been around people. Why? why? <laughs> yeah, they're the worst people. You guys are great. Everyone else is the... <laughs> Disciple making is messy. I heard a pastor in, in Las Vegas, uh, I heard a, a guy who's a pastor in Las Vegas tell this story recently. He said he was walking through a... Um, a casino with a friend of his, and he said, and, and, and something happened to me that had never happened before and has never happened since. He was talking and, and walking with this friend of his, and a friend, the friend, right in the middle of a sentence, didn't stop, didn't anything, just right in the middle of the sen sentence, just puked everywhere in the casino, just barfed everywhere. So he's, yeah, you know, the other day I was going to, and then everywhere in the casino. And so, so this pastor is talking about, he goes, oh man, what, what do I do here? So he looked at his friend and he said, are you going to do that again? And his friend said, I might do that again. And so he grabbed him and kind of, kind of turned him around. And as he turned him around, a woman walked right through the middle and he literally saw her go like this, feet up, hands up, boom, splat. And as he turned around, he walked he walked back by her and, and he literally saw her look at her hands and go, what is this? And his response was, that is Mexican food. <laughs> he this pastor and his friend completely ignored this woman and he just kind of kept, you know, escorting his friend to the bathroom. And he, and he looked at the congregation that he was preaching to and he goes, and that's discipleship. It's messy. I didn't ask to get in other people's puke. I didn't ask to get in other people's junk. Sometimes you get involved in the disciple making process and you look down at yourself and go, what is this? This is bad. This, it's, but it's messy. Disciple making is messy. And let's just acknowledge that together. When you get involved in people's life, when you get to know them real well, when you start making disciples, you start to realize, oh man, people are messed up, real messed up. But Jesus, and this is point number one, if you're taking notes, we haven't even had a point yet. Point number one is this, Jesus does not care about any of your excuses. He doesn't. And I'll prove it to you from the text. He doesn't care about any of your excuses. I, as a pastor and as your friend, a human being who loves you guys very much, I care very deeply about your excuses. I do. I empathize. I, I want to know. I want to listen. Guess who doesn't? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus doesn't care. So if you want somebody to care, come find me. If you want somebody to disregard your excuses, go find Jesus. Watch in the text. 
Verse 16, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. But some doubted. Matthew could have left that verse out. He could have said, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, he could have left that verse out. Easy peasy, but he didn't. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And yet Jesus still commanded them to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Here are some of the excuses I give myself and that I hear people use for I, I can't be a disciple maker. I don't know enough. I don't, I don't know enough of the Bible yet. I, I'm not quite sure how to do it. I'm still new to the faith. I still struggle with my own faith. I'm one of those guys who, who doubt it. And yet Jesus comes along and says, I know you have uncertainty. I know you have lack of conviction. I know you struggle and I love you and I don't care. <laughs> Go therefore and make disciples. Number two, point number two, discipleship is a bad case of the normals. Discipleship is a bad case of the normals. And I'll prove it to you from the text. See, sometimes I think... We think the big dogs do discipleship. The, the, the pastors do discipleship. The evangelists do discipleship. The scholars and theologians do discipleship. And then the real kooky guys who are real into discipleship, like Al, he does discipleship. But the rest of us, we don't do discipleship. But, but for Jesus, discipleship is a bad case of the normals. It is the requirement and the call of every believer to be a disciple and to make disciples. It's a bad case of the normals. That word in there, and we're, we, here we go. We'll do, the, we'll do the Greek stuff here. Verse 19, go therefore. Everybody circle that word go. Circle that word go. The, the, probably the best way to translate that word is as you are going. Therefore, make disciples of all nations. As you are going, as you live your life, as you work, as you play, as you shuttle your kids to school, as you hunt, as you fish, as you go to the gym, as you get coffee, as you wake up, as you lie down, as you go to Scottsdale Gun Club, as you hold your wife's purse while she tries on clothes, as you pay bills, as you vote, as you spend the day by the pool, as you vacation, buy groceries, and anything else that you do, as you go, therefore, make disciples. It's, it's not just a call for the 11 here. Jesus did call the 11, but most scholars say that he called all of his followers together. This was everybody that had followed him when he was on the earth. Not just the 11 disciples do discipleship. Everybody does discipleship. It's a requirement and a call for every believer. It is a bad case of the normals. I read a story this week about a guy named Leighton Ford who uh, was an evangelist, used to run around with Billy Graham and tour with Billy Graham. They had this big... Um, kind of revival service, like a Billy Graham crusade deal. And Leighton Ford was preaching on Friday night and he gave the gospel presentation. He gave the gospel message and Billy Graham was going to preach the next night. And Billy Graham was there while Leighton Ford was preaching. And he was sitting in the back and he kind of had a hat on and glasses and nobody really knew who he was. And so a few, uh, like a few feet in front of him was another man sitting on this hill. They were outside sitting on this hill. So um, Billy Graham's thinking, you know, I want to do some personal evangelism today. And I can see that this man maybe is responding to the gospel call. So um, Billy Graham walked up, tapped this man on the shoulder and he said, uh, sir, uh, would you like to receive Christ today? Would you like to respond to the gospel? And again, this guy doesn't know who Billy Graham is. He knows Billy Graham is a big name, but Billy Graham's kind of incognito. So he says, sir, would you like to respond to the gospel? I'd be happy to walk down with you if you wanted to give your life to Christ. And he says, yeah, I really do, but I'll just wait till tomorrow when the big dog gets here. <laughs> so he's waiting for Billy Graham to preach the next day. How often do we do that? That guy probably needs a discipler but I'll just wait for the big dog to do it. I'll wait for the minister. I'll wait for so on and so forth. My job 
as a pastor, my call as a pastor is not to make disciples. My call as a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, according to Ephesians. So my call as a pastor is to equip you to be a disciple maker. I'm not supposed to be the disciple maker as a pastor. I'm supposed to equip the saints to be disciple makers. As a Christian, I'm a disciple maker. I don't have anything to do with my pastoral ability, my, my vocational ministry, my calling, anything. As a Christian, each one of us is called to be a disciple maker. It is a bad case of the normals. Point number three, discipleship means you will probably end up smelling like B.O. Axe body spray and Skittles. <laughs> we'll get there, but write it down. Discipleship <laughs> probably means that you will smell like B.O. Axe body spray and Skittles. In other words, you're going to smell like a junior high kid. <laughs> B.O., Axe body spray and Skittles. You ever walk into a junior high school or like a junior high ministry at church? You know that smell? Junior high kids? That's what that is. It's B.O., Axe body spray and Skittles. And it's a wonderful combination that we could probably use in chemical warfare if we decided to. I mean, it is just outstanding. But look at what the text says. Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of what? All the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus, he could have left that out. Again, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He could have left it out, but he didn't. Why did he include it? Because the call to discipleship is broad. The call to discipleship in the immediate context is for Jews and Gentiles. It's from people from all all nations, all walks of life, every color, every ethnicity, every age group. And the likelihood is discipleship in your life is good. It's going to look like someone who does not look like you. Someone who's different than you. All ability levels, all nationalities, all genders, everyone. Discipleship. And being a disciple maker means you got to get close to those folks. Discipleship requires proximity. You, you can't be a discipler from afar. You can't be a disciple. Like writing books, I was reading Francis Chan last night, right? It, 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 Francis Chan is teaching people to be disciple, d disciplers, but he's not being a discipler in writing that book. Francis Chan is a discipler because he smells like B.O. Axe Body Spray and Skittles. Because he gets around people that need discipleship. That need to know Jesus. That need to learn how to obey him and trust him. That need to give their lives to him. And typically, it's not going to look real good on you. I'll just be straight with you. It didn't look good on Jesus. What did they accuse him of? Who is this man who hangs out with drunkards and whores? All right? So it's probably not going to look real good on you either. But who's in charge of your reputation? You or God? God. God is in charge of your reputation. And in order to be a disciple maker, we have to make a decision, men, that it's okay to smell like B.O. Axe Body Spray and Skittles. <laughs> I'm not saying go into a bar. If you struggle with alcohol abuse, I'm going to a bar and get around those guys and, and compromise your morality. Please don't hear me saying that. What I'm saying is this. The people who need discipleship are probably going to look, act, and feel like people who need discipleship. You understand? They're not disciples yet. They need you to come along and be a discipler. Listen to this statistic real quick. It'll tell you, who really needs discipleship? 19 of every 20 people who become Christians do so before the age of 24. 19 of every 20 do so before the age of 24. After 25, only one in 10,000. After 35, one in 40,000. After 45, one in 200,000. After 55, one in 300,000. After 65, one in 500,000. After 74, only one in 700,000 give their life to Jesus. 
This is a matter of passing a baton on to a younger generation who needs you really, really badly. Our, our country's not going down the tubes because we vote the wrong people in the office. <laughs> our country's going down the tubes because we don't obey the Great Commission. Did we vote? Nah. I, I, I mean, it's that secondary stuff. It's just secondary stuff. That's, uh, Jesus didn't come back from the dead to tell us how to vote, right? Or to encourage us to, you know, don't drink too much. <laughs> he came back from the dead to say, go, therefore, and make disciples. Be a disciple maker. And it probably means you're going to smell like B.O., Axe Body Spray, and Skittles. Finally, and this is my favorite part of the passage. Jesus empowers discipleship. And he could have left it out. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, period. Could have stopped. Could have stopped, right? Could have been done. Could have been done. And what did he include? And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Guys, as we get about the business of discipleship, as we get about the business of the Great Commission, of coming alongside people who need Jesus really bad, really bad. If, if we believe the things we talked about this year, this spring, in terms of sin and God's greatness and the reality that Jesus will rescue and redeem and renew, gosh, then this call to discipleship makes total sense, right? And as we get about the business of discipleship, it's going to be hard. It's going to be messy, there are going to be times where we look down and go, what is this? It's, it's going to be difficult. But Jesus, in his gentleness and wisdom, whispers to you and me, but I, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. David Livingston was a world-renowned doctor and missionary. By the time he returned to his native Scotland, to address the students at Glasgow University, he was an absolute mess. The previous 16 years had been spent in the service of God on the content of Af continent of Africa. As he stood before the young men at Glasgow University, the tremendous price exacted of Livingston was plain to see. More than 27 fevers had coursed through his veins, leaving his body emaciated and ravaged. One arm hung useless at his side. It was the result of being mangled by a lion in the service of God in Africa. The core of his message to those young people was this. Shall I tell you what sustained me amidst the toil, the hardship, and the loneliness of my exile? It was Christ's promise. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus doesn't care about our excuses. He empowers us anyway. Discipleship is a bad case of the normals. It's not just for the pros or for the real kooky guys. It's a call for all believers. Discipleship's gonna get messy because it means you gotta be close to people who need it. And Jesus empowers discipleship. We got three minutes left. And so I'm gonna say this last thing and then we'll take questions and be done. Guys, I I beg you, go be a disciple maker. I, I beg you, make a willful, deliberate, premeditated decision to make some life adjustments. It's a process. It's going to take time. But go be a disciple maker. Change the world from the bottom up. Get around guys like me and young guys, and they're dying for it. They might not act like they're dying for it all the time, but they're dying for it. And they're dying because they don't have it. Get around people that are your age, peers, and disciple. Come alongside, walk with them, introduce them to Jesus. And just like Jesus said in Matthew 28, instruct them to obey all that he's commanded because he'll empower that. If, 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 if I could say one thing 
to just close our time up at Marketplace this spring, it would be this. I beg you, please, for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Jesus, who has all authority on he in heaven and on earth, for the sake of things eternal that will matter forever, go be a disciple maker. Talk about Israel, talk about the end times, talk about the deep theological stuff that we talked about, investigate the Greek, do all that stuff, do all that. But above all else, be able to look back on your life and say, I carried out the great commission. I made disciples. I made a dent by making disciples. Please, for Jesus' sake. Let me pray. God, we recognize that this is not easy. We beg you to give us hearts that long to see you get glory because of discipleship, because we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow you and teach others to do the same. We model it. We talk about it as we go, even as you talk about in Matthew 28, that we're making disciples of all nations. God, teach us to be disciple makers. In Christ's name, amen.